Good evening, everybody. Why don't I just uh, pray for us real quick? God, uh, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world, and it's hard to make sense of it. Uh, it's hard to be okay with it. It's hard to experience it. It's hard to see it in others. But I thank you that you've got real answers uh, from your word that really shed light on your goodness, your greatness, and the human condition. And I just pray that uh, our time together tonight can help us understand that better. Amen. The philosophical question... So, I mean, this is not an uncommon issue. This is not something that most of us have no experience with, whether, you know, we've never taken a philosophy class or not. This is one of the classic objections to raise up against the idea of an all-powerful God who is good. Some people think it goes back to the Epicurean paradox. Uh, They attribute this to Epicurus around 300 BC. And... uh, it basically, he, it's thought that he worded it something like this. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Well, then he's not all powerful, right? Is God able to prevent evil but not willing? Well, then how can we say God is good? Is God both able and willing to prevent evil? Then how come there's evil? And then finally, is he neither able nor willing If he's not powerful enough to stop evil and he's not good enough to want to stop evil, then why call him God? And this is a question that, you know, we can look at and we can say that makes a lot of sense. You know, as we look out into the world, as we think about what we see, what's in our hearts, what's in our life experience, what's what we see in the world around us, we recognize there's something very wrong, that this is not okay. What's happening in the world is not okay. Man's inhumanity to man, if things are going to be this messed up, then, you know, what does that say about its creator? What does that say about God? How could there be so much pain and suffering, so much hardship, so much selfishness, so much greed, so much pain, if a powerful and good being is in charge? How does that work? It's confusing to think about. Why And how could there be so much injustice in the world if God is good? So philosophers have, you know, worked this over, over, you know, a millennia and, you know, come at it with different approaches. But, you know, logically speaking, there is a very good and very simple answer to this. God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil in the world. That fits logically. It works you know, and it's very difficult to disprove that, to say, well, God has his reasons, and his reasons must be good if God is good. We just don't know what they are. But it's not very satisfying, especially when you yourself are suffering or when you see suffering happening. When you're bothered by what you see on the news, you're like, well, God must have morally sufficient reasons for allowing this to happen. And thankfully, the Bible goes much further than that. And brings us into deep thinking and reflection about this question. Because we see man's inhumanity to man. The way that we treat one another, the way that we disappoint one another, the way that we take from one another. We see natural disasters, earthquakes, cancer. We see tsunamis that come and wipe out some of the poorest and already some of the most suffering people in the world, and we rightly and understandably cry out, where is God? We see evil people flourishing, given an advantage, because they don't follow the rules, because they're not moral people, and we see good people suffering. And so it's easy to look out and just say, there is something desperately wrong. And it's not like this is just, you know, an academic exercise. The way that we answer this, the way that we view this, the way that we see it really has an impact on the way we see everything else, certainly the way we see God. Some people look at the suffering in the world 
And they find God because of the suffering. They're, they're saying, I can't do this on my own. I'm looking at what's out there. I don't have the resources. This is too hard. This is too much. I need to know that there's something greater than myself. And they look and they find the God of the Bible. Some of us already believe in God, and we look at this question, and suffering and pain and hardship draw us closer to Him. He is our God of comfort. He's our refuge. He's our rock. Others blame and hate God. I could never believe. I could never accept. I don't want to know. I can't be close. I will not be close to a God who would let this happen to somebody that I love or to a God that would let this happen to me. Others just say, well, I just cannot accept the idea that there is a God because of what I see in the world and the pain and the suffering in my life. I, I reject the idea that God could even exist. We have an entire spectrum of people who look at this and wrestle with this, but you can see how, how you answer that really would affect the way that you see a lot of different things. And so our question in this series really is, is the Bible relevant on this question? Can the Bible today help us make some headway in our understanding of what we see in the world and the pain and the suffering that we see. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about this. The Bible clearly teaches the existence of rampant evil. It's not as though the Bible's saying, God is good and he's all powerful, and I don't know what evil you're talking about. It all looks good to me. <laughs> That's not the biblical perspective at all. Psalm 142, two for three, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see there are, if there are any who understand, if there are any who seek God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does evil, not even one, no, who does good, not even one. I mean, that's a pretty damning statement that God looks down at what's happening here and what he sees is predominantly evil. He sees all of it. The pain, the suffering, the hardship, the selfishness, the wickedness. And he is not okay with it according to the scriptures. The Bible rigorously upholds the value of human life. God says that we matter a lot. We matter a lot to him. He cares for us. And that human life is precious to him. In Psalm 139, 13 through 14, the psalmist says, talking to God about his own experience of his creation. And he says, you formed me in my inward parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and your soul knows it very well. That I matter, God, because you have said that I matter. And that I am not just slammed together by time and chemicals and happenstance, but that you very intentionally, me as an individual, took the time to consider who I should be, how I should be made, and you were involved carefully in that process. It's a fascinating picture of who God is and our relationship to Him. The Bible powerfully declares the unlimited abilities of God, the power of God, Job, in the midst of his suffering, turns to God in Job 42 too and says, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. We don't have an out here and that God just doesn't have the ability to do something about the pain and the suffering that we experience. And it boldly, the Bible also boldly defends the goodness of God. Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just a God of faithfulness without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. So we have all the components of Epicurus's dilemma right there. And the Bible says all those are declarations of truth about who God is. So how do we resolve that? <coughs> Interestingly and importantly, the Bible is not ignorant to the issue of the problem of evil. It talks about it. It addresses it. I mean, there are prophets. There are people that have experiences. A great example is Habakkuk. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, he's watching all the suffering that's going on in the people around him, and he cries out and says, Oh, Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. What do you make me, 
Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Well, that's the problem of evil right there. A prophet of God is looking about and saying, God, how could you let justice be so perverted? God's answer, Habakkuk 5, he says, look among the nations, observe and be astonished, wonder, because I am doing things in your days you would not believe if you were told. What is God saying? He's saying, I know what it looks like from your perspective, but I am aware, I am involved, and I do have a plan. There's a larger plan at work. This is often the way that God answers this question, and it's not super satisfactory. It's good to know that God says, I agree, it's a problem, and I'm on it. You just have to wait to see what it looks like in the end. And we're like, but it's been an awfully long time, and there's an awful lot of suffering happening. Job asks a similar question. Job was called by the Bible the most righteous man at earth, on earth in his time. And he goes through all kinds of unjust suffering and bad circumstances and um, has a horrible time. And he cries out to God, what, how can you let this be? Why are you letting this happen to me? I follow you. I love you. I've done my best to keep your commandments and, and to live my life your way. And my life is a wreck. And God answers in Job 38, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets the measurements since you know? Or who, who stretched the line on it? Who on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Which is kind of a gruff answer. It's not dissimilar from what Habakkuk got, which is God is saying, Listen, I've been around from the beginning, and there's a plan. It's in motion. I'm aware of it. I'm not ignorant to these things, and you have to trust me. I was there, and I set this entire thing in motion, and I'm not an idiot. Essentially, it's God's answer to those prophets. And you say, well, okay. I mean, it's good to know that the Bible just doesn't pretend like this issue doesn't exist. But when we go back to that question, does God have morally sufficient reasons for permitting evil in the world? I think, you know, I feel like if God wants my allegiance, my love, my followership, we're going to have to do better than I'm working on it. We're going to have to do better than that. Another question that I think is at the heart of this, maybe even more so, is can I trust him with this problem? Do I believe and do I see and is there enough evidence for the goodness of God, the trustworthiness of God, that when I see the problem that is a horrendous problem and I turn to him and I say, what about that? And he says, I'm on it, just trust me, there's a plan. Is he trustworthy to accept that answer? What are God's reasons? What are these morally sufficient reasons for allowing all the pain and suffering that we see? Well, there's some really good clues. I wouldn't say, I, 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 here's a full confession. I don't have what I would call an ironclad, sufficient, fully sufficient argument to answer all of these questions. I am on a journey. I am praying and I am studying and I am reading and I'm finding some stuff that really helps but it does not, I am not someone who sits back and says, well, I'm okay with the pain and suffering in the world because God's got a plan. I think the pain and the suffering and the injustice in the world sucks. And I think God thinks it sucks too. And I think we have a lot more in Scripture than just, I have a plan, you'll see in the end. It starts with Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We go all the way back to the creation of the universe, specifically to the part where the human race is being created. 
And it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That we are uniquely created by God to reflect the nature and character of who he is. That there is something special about us that has the truth of who God is in us in a way that nothing else in creation does. And when God created us on the sixth day and he ceased from his creation, the world and the universe, everything had been made, God said all that he had been, saw all that he had made and behold, he said, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So God gets done and he makes you and me and everything and the entire world and he looks at it and says, this is good. This is what I intended. This is a reflection of my nature and my character. And this is beautiful and wonderful and good. And so the first clue that we have, I think, is when we look at the fact that God made man in our Im- God made man in his image, is that something has gone wrong. Because God is good and we are not. We are not who God made us to be. We are not what God made us to be. We may still have aspects of the image of God, the character of God. We're capable of some pretty amazing things, love being chief among them. But we're capable of some things that are not so good. We were created by God as good, and yet we have been twisted and corrupted away from what God intended us to be. All of God's creation was good, that there was harmony and there was unity and there was peace and there was love, and yet somehow evil corrupted not only the heart and the nature of mankind, but creation itself has been twisted by something that happened shortly after the creation. People like to approach the problem of evil and they say, well, could God have created a perfect life for us? Could he have just created it so everything was good and everyone loved each other and everyone got along and there was no pain and suffering? And the answer is yes, he could have done that. And in fact, he did do that. That's how it started. That was his intent. That's what he made. People say, well, could he have created an environment that wouldn't turn against us, that wouldn't have earthquakes and floods and cancer? And it's like, yes, he could. And he did. That's what he made. And people say, well, could we have bodies that couldn't die or be damaged and feel pain? And it's like, yes, that's what he did. According to Genesis 1, he made it all and he said, it is very good. They said, well, then couldn't he create people that would never do anything evil? Well, that is a very interesting question, isn't it? That's the important thing that we have to look at here. Because we see that God, whether he could have or not, is one question. But what we definitely see is that he did not. He did not create people that were incapable of evil. He laid out the garden. He laid out everything that we would need. He put us in this environment. We were there together. In Genesis 2, 16, the Lord commanded the man saying, from, eat from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you will surely die. What does that represent? What he's saying is, is you can have, you have absolute freedom. You can do whatever you want to do. You're good. I trust you. There's one rule. One rule is don't eat from this one tree and this one part of the garden. Because what this tree represents is choice. And you have the ability to follow me or you have the ability to rebel against me. And that choice is real and it's substantive and it's meaningful. And if you choose to rebel from me, who's the source of life, the creator of all things then you are going to be cut off from me. You're going to be cut off from life. You're going to be cut off from my protection. And I don't want that from you, but I'm going to put this tree here so that you can choose. This 
is what made evil possible in a human context. Free moral agency. You see, the thing about free moral agency is you can have beings that are perfectly obedient. You can create fabulously complicated, complex beings, but what a being that is perfectly obedient without choice cannot have is love. Think about it. What is love? What is the value of love? The value of love is we don't have to love each other, but we choose to love each other. Somebody who is a free moral agent who can do whatever they want, like whoever they want, love whoever they want, spend their time with whoever they want, give to whoever they want, decides to give substantially of themselves to you. That's what has value. That's what being a person is. You can have beings with free will, and those beings with free will can choose to love, but by definition, they also have to be able to choose to rebel. That choice has to be real in order for love to exist. So we return again. Does God have morally sufficient reasons for permitting evil in the world? Well, without free will, there is no love. And God is the God of love. The primary, most important aspect of who God is, the ruling ethic and virtue of the universe, according to the Bible, according to God, is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is the most important thing there is, the most powerful thing there is. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 puts it on a whole other plane, says, but now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love is more important than hope. And as far as God is concerned, love is more important than faith. And if you know anything about God, faith is something he considers to be pretty important. But love is greater. So when God decided to create, he wasn't going to create automatons. He was not going to create beings that could not choose because he wanted there to be love. And we say, okay, but why didn't God create free will beings that would never make the wrong choice, huh? Why don't we just do that? Can God do that? And the answer actually very clearly is no. God couldn't do that. And you say, oh, I got gotcha. you. You just said God couldn't do something, right? Does God have limits? Yes. God is limited in that he can't be crazy. <laughs> God is a rational being. He cannot create things that are a contradiction in and of themselves. You know, I remember, you know, every first year philosophy student would love to, you know, you'd be at the bar on campus and, you know, somebody would be like, oh, you believe in God, do you? Well, can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? And you'd be like, I have another drink, you know? <laughs> That's a logical contradiction. You're pitting the nature of God against itself. No, there cannot be a rock so big in creation. God could not make a rock so big that he couldn't pick it up because if he made it, he would be able to pick it up. It doesn't make sense. It's nonsensical. It's the same thing when someone says, can God create a square circle? The definition of a square, by definition, excludes a circle. A circle has no corners. A square has four. They cannot be the same. So God can't make a square circle. In the same way, God can't, create a free will being that's incapable of rebellion. It's a logical contradiction within itself. God cannot do it because it's stupid. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It can't exist. Can God create a world without the capacity for moral evil? Yes, he can. Did he? No, he did not. Why? Because that world would have no people in it. It's not possible. You could have a world where there was no capacity for evil, but by definition, it wouldn't have people. 
It wouldn't have people, means it wouldn't have relationship, and not having relationship means it wouldn't have love. John Lennox, one of my favorite authors on this subject, and uh, a mathematician emeritus at Oxford, says, when we wish for a world without the capacity for evil, we are wishing ourselves out of existence. And I thought that was really profound. You know, when we look at the problem of evil, when we look at this, we say, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why couldn't God just eliminate all potential for pain and suffering? He's like, well, he could, but it would mean wiping us all out forever. But there would be no free will, no choice, no relationship, and no love. Jean-Paul Sartre, or if you went to public school like me, Jean-Paul Sartre, And the being in nothingness wrote that the tyrant scorns love. He is content with fear. If he seeks to win the love of his subjects, it is for political reasons. And if he finds a more economical way to enslave them, he adopts it immediately. On the other hand, the man who wants to be loved does not desire the enslavement of the beloved. He is not bent on becoming the object of passion which flows forth mechanically. He does not want to possess an automaton. You ask that question, well, why didn't God just create beings that were complex but had to obey? And the answer is the same reason we would find no satisfaction in a relationship like that either. It comes down to the basic order of following programming, which is not love. It's not relationship. Does God have morally sufficient reasons for permitting evil in the world? Well, God is no tyrant. He's not looking for automatons. He's not looking, he's not like God just sits up there and just feels so good when he's obeyed. And he's just like, yes, obey me more. He's looking for beings with intelligence, with minds, with hearts, with spirit, with souls, with personality, and with freedom who would use that freedom to choose a connection with him. God values real love and relationship. And so creating free will beings is risky. Now, you and I might look at that and look at his choice in that and say, you know what? I think the risk isn't worth it. I blame God because he brought free will beings into this world, and that is what created the potentiality for all this pain and suffering. And if you want to take that position, you can, but you cannot have any children. Because what is it that we do when we bring children into the world? We bring children into the world in the hopes that they will come and develop, and we do all that we can to pour into them the goodness and the morals, and we want them to be good people, and we want them to make the world a better place, and we believe in them, and we nurture them, and we hope. But at the end of the day, our kids are free will beings. And you don't know that if you have a child, that that child will, do, will not wind up doing more harm than good. It's not up to you. And yet we choose to do it anyway. Why? Because of the hope of relationship. Because of the drive and the desire to bring more people into the world for us to love and connect with. And the sincere hope and desire that they will be good people. Is this not exactly what God has done in creating man. Now, I want to make a note on this. I'm not arguing for dualism. Dualism says in order for good to exist, evil has to exist. And that is not what the Bible holds because God existed for an eternity past and he is good and there was no evil. So good does not need evil in order to exist. What we are saying is love cannot exist without free will, without choice. It has to be there. Well, what about natural disasters and floods and all of that? You know, why would God create a world with earthquakes, floods, and mosquitoes, right? Well, we see from Scripture, we get more clues. Creation itself was deformed by our rebellion. When we chose to rebel against God, nature itself reverberated with the consequences of those choices, 
Galatians 3, 17 and 19 says, Then to Adam God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles that shall grow from you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because it is from where you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That nature itself was distorted and deformed as we chose to step out of God's grace. Romans 8, 19, 22, Paul says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom and the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now, that the earth itself cannot wait to throw off this corruption and that God himself promises that in a future time there will be a new heaven and a new earth in perfect harmony and connection with him and with all life. That's the promise and the relevance of the Bible is saying a time is coming, God says. He not only says things got off track and this is not how I designed it and this is not not a reflection of my character. He says, I'm going to bring it back and there is going to be a time where I will set things right. And the natural world will be at peace. Isaiah looks forward in Isaiah 65 to a time in verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in my holy mountain, says the Lord. There's another verse in Isaiah that talks about a little baby playing with a cobra. And you're like, that's hard to imagine. But that God is saying, when I remake things whole, There will be no pain, there will be no suffering, there will be no violence, and there will be no injustice. It will be set back to what it was intended to be. So finally, we come then to that second part of the question, can we trust him with this problem? Can we trust God? I think we've seen some aspects and some evidence of the way that God thinks about this and the reality of how this being, this existence that we are all a part of, came to be the way that it is, that how could we be so good, so noble, so capable of good things, and so twisted? How could nature be so beautiful and majestic and so vicious? But can we trust God that when he says, I'm on it, can that be a sufficient answer given the horrible state of the world that we live in? and the pain and the suffering that we see. God creates a world with the potential for evil, but another important thing to remember and to note that Scripture makes very clear is that God doesn't stand back and watch. He's not a kid with a chemistry set throwing stuff together and running behind a a trash can to see if it blows up. He's intimately involved and experiencing it as we experience it. He doesn't just create free will beings. He allows our decisions, our decisions, have an impact on him. Isn't that remarkable? Psalm 78, 40 says, How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. We make God sad. God looks at how we live. He looks at how we treat each other. He looks at the pain and the suffering in the world, and it grieves him. It moves him. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. God is looking. God is watching. God is involved, and he cares, and he's impacted by the things that we do. Luke 13, 34, Jesus looks at the city of Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as children, just as hen, a hen gathers her brood under his wings, but you wouldn't have it. Come home to me. Stop doing this to each other and come home. And God is moved by that. He's impacted by that. 
John eleven thirty three through 35. Lazarus, his friend, drops dead. And when Jesus saw his, the, Lazarus' his sister weeping, and the Jews came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And he wept. Even though he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he looked at the pain and the suffering and the loss of death, which was not a part of his plan for the human existence. And he was deeply moved deeply grieved. The problem of evil is often formulated this way. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? God's answer to that is, I'm the best person, the most righteous, the most powerful person that ever was, and I let the worst thing happen to me in the person of Jesus Christ. He doesn't, he not only watches what happens, But he comes and he took on flesh and he lived among us and he subjected himself to our evil. God and the person of Jesus Christ experienced rejection, abuse, betrayal. He was unjustly accused and tried. He was humiliated, stripped naked, mocked, beaten, tortured, hung on a cross and killed. Because he came and demonstrated what? Love. He spent his whole life telling us that he wanted us to love him and love one another. He said that's the greatest commandment in all of Scripture, that you could take the whole Bible and you could boil it down to just those two points. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's who God is in a nutshell, and that's what God wants from us in a nutshell. That's how Jesus lived his life. But he was a threat. He was a threat to the religious. He was a threat to the evil. And so he experienced all the worst that the human race has to dish out, and then some. And then, while he hung on that cross, God took the wrath, the judgment for the entire human race, and poured a out on himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He took the punishment that we deserve upon himself for all time. The best person that ever was had the worst thing that ever happened to him happen to him. He experienced it personally for us. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall upon him. We need to think about that when we think about the problem of evil, when we think about the injustice in the world. Romans 5, 8 through 10, but God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, while we were shaking our fist at him, saying, how could you call yourself good and let the world be the way that it is? Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God is not uninvolved. He is as involved as can be. He created this. He thought it was worth it. He had morally sufficient reasons for allowing all the evil to occur in the world. And then he came down and took the wrath for all of it. Can we trust God with this problem? The cross really puts that in a different light, doesn't it? We still may not agree But I hope at the very least that you're understanding that there are reasons. There is a rational explanation for what it is that we're looking at here, for what it is that we're experiencing. God is not impersonal. God is not unaware. God is not distant. He is not detached, and he is not disinterested in our suffering. God came and suffered in our place in the ultimate sense. 
because he knew there was great injustice in the world and that someone had to pay. And he did this in the hope that we would be reconciled to him, be given new life, and be granted into a new eternity with him where there would be no pain and no suffering. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to a knowledge of him. Can we trust God with this problem? In order to understand this, we have to understand his solution. That he has set up eternity with him. That that is the promise. God looks at us and he says, I know that you're looking around and you're wondering, am I good? And I know you're looking around and you're seeing all this pain and suffering. But what could make it worth it? The promise of a new life, of a new eternity together with him and with each other, in which there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no loss, there is no evil. But that we could live on in that eternity. You say, well, how are you going to have eternity where there's no evil if you still have free will beings? Because you're going to have people like us who have experienced evil and had enough of it. We're going to look back at this time and say, I never want to go there again. We have experienced evil. We have perpetrated evil upon our fellow man and we have seen the consequences and given the chance our answer for all eternity will be no never again will I go down that road I know what rebellion against God looks like and I have had enough having been rescued from it we will not return and then God himself revelation 21 3 through 4 he says I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and he shall be their people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there no longer will be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. How's that for a vision? God will take you from your time here on earth and he will bring you home you ever had the tears wiped away from your eyes from another human being it's a very intimate experience you know just coming in close and saying i know how bad this hurts but the time of hurting is over and now we have an eternity with something better something wholly good that is love i think about it this way this is just my imagination now. This isn't scripture or anything. I think in heaven there, must, there, there, there has to be like a museum of evil, right? Where you'll be walking around and you'll be like, oh, what's that big building? It's like, oh, that's the museum of evil, right? And like, what's in there? And you go in and there's like all of man's inhum inhumanity to man. I'm talking like four billion years in the future, right? And we'll be there, right? And we'll be sitting there, you know, and we'll be talking about, oh, yeah, I remember back, oh, it was so bad. 80, 90 years of utter reprehensible behavior on my part. And there'll be beings there that didn't experience it, that never experienced, have never been fallen, have never broken away from God. And they'll be like, what was it like? How was it? How can you, how can you have lived apart from God? I can't even imagine that. And the Bible says that we are going to be living testimonies of the goodness of God, of the grace of God. That our job in eternity future is going to be to say, listen, do not rebel. It does not work. It's horrible. You don't want to go there. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ because by grace you have been saved and raises us up with him and seats us with him in the heavenly places so that the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Be up there in the museum of heaven and someone will say, what was it like? The question will be, like, where were you during the war? Right? That was a question that, 
people in the builder generation, World War II generation, you know, they always wanted to have a good answer to that because there was evil and wickedness in the world. Where were you during the war? And that's a question that I think we are going to want to answer. Where were you when evil reigned in the hearts of men? And the answer is going to be, I was one. I was in the thick of it. Hurting, being selfish, saying things that hurt the people I loved the most. I couldn't even stop myself. I watched children starving on the news. I saw the pain and the suffering of the poor. And God came into my life and he told me that I could be saved. He told me that if I put my faith in him, he would accept me even as horrible as I was. And I shook my fist at him and I said, I will be my own God and I will decide right and wrong for myself. And they'll be like, what? And we'll be like, I know, it was crazy. <laughs> but eventually over time, I came to see that I could not be the person that I wanted to be. I had to surrender myself to him. And when I did, he forgave me for everything that I ever did and everything that I would do in the future. That's how great God is. You don't want to rebel from him. He went to the cross and he died for my sins so that I could be here. I would not be here if it wasn't that God was willing to die for a sinner such as me. And then, then I got involved. Then I went out and tried to do something about the injustice with the time that I had. And I tried to tell other people. And I tried to use the time that I had left to let people know how great God was and that they could have the gift that I had been given. And that we could make a difference in this life about the pain and the suffering and the injustice. That's the stand. That's the conversation that I want to have again and again in the museum of evil when I'm in heaven is to tell people I would not be here if it wasn't for the love and the mercy of God. But once God finally found me, I really wanted to help others. And I really wanted to take that time when I was in the midst of all that pain and suffering and fight injustice and make a difference to help others find the great love that I found. Is the Bible relevant today? That question, how can an all-powerful, loving God allow evil to exist, is a difficult question. But I hope what you've seen is there are some pretty compelling answers. There's some pretty meaningful ways to approach this question from Scripture. I also think it's the wrong question. A better question uh, instead of that would be, I think and do evil, why then, if there is a God, does he tolerate me? That's a better formulation of that question, and that is something that God, I think, asks each of us to wrestle with. Why, with the problems that I have and the pain that I have caused, would God tolerate me? Because if you ask that question, what you will find is Jesus Christ. That it's not what we deserve. It's not that God was obligated, but that he offers us freedom and hope and love and eternal life and forgiveness through Jesus' death on the cross. These answers are insufficient, and I'll close with this thought. It's not enough. I think that, you know, it's important to know these things. It's important to wrestle with these things. But if you go to somebody who's in the midst of suffering and be like, well, there's a couple of different reasons and here's some evidence, you will not be helping them. <laughs> because when you're in the midst of that pain and that suffering, when someone is going through an incredible injustice, what they need is someone to come alongside, someone to put their arm around them, someone to pray for them, someone to give them hope, someone to bring them meals, someone to watch their kids, someone to lift them up, someone to serve them, someone to help them. So that when they survive, when they make it through the suffering, and then they start to ask real questions, trying to understand the meaning behind of it, then some of this stuff can help. But that we are called by God to move towards suffering people with love, with compassion, and with help. 
And we can agree even to this moment. We have to be able to agree there is no answer in the moment that can suffice. I am not satisfied, but I am hopeful. I don't look at the pain and the suffering in the world coldly and say, well, God's got all the answers to that. I look at it and I say, let's be moved as God is moved to help and do something about it. But let's remember, as Isaiah says in 41.10, God says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you, and surely I will uphold you with my righteousness and my right hand. When God sees us suffering, he offers encouragement, he offers strength, he offers, he offers help. In Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous and do not tremble or, dis or, or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.